Periodicals are only one instance of how visual cultures influence reading practices, however, and they are not as contemporary as sites of electronic literature. However, these items participate in these in my argument, these items participate in the same dynamics as the digital reading practices that have more than probably anything else formed the wedge between items and works um, from which I'm working. Um, insofar as they force readers to reconsider their understanding of the physical vehicles delivering anticipated reading experiences. So the broad movement from, or more accurately, between page to screen introduces new kinds of visual complexity in addition to textual arrangements that challenge the linearity of the codex. These physical components um, of digital items bear equally on the categories that orient and direct our aesthetic experiences. And paradoxically for a medium that is often seen as immaterial, um, further foreground the role of textual materiality in producing aesthetic experiences to begin with. Catherine Hales, for instance, anticipates new forms of reading as a result of this longitudinal digital shift. She states, quote, literary studies has been slow to address these possibilities, um, however, because it continues to view close reading of print texts as the field's essence, unquote. She sees close reading as entering a new stage of sometimes uncomfortable cohabitation with what she calls hyper-reading, a practice engendered by the physical realities of digital textual representation. Hyper-reading, according to Hales, has some similarities with machine reading insofar as they excel in identifying patterns which consist, quote, of regularities that appear through a series of related differences and similarities, end quote. Close reading, she argues, has the advantage of providing a monolocal or rich context, while hyper-reading works in multilocal or poor context, and machine reading can just eliminate context altogether. In general, Hales adopts a pragmatic approach to these different reading practices. She says, quote, the more the emphasis falls on pattern as in machine reading, the more likely it is that context must be supplied from outside by a human interpreter to connect pattern with meaning. The more the emphasis falls on meaning, as in close reading, the more pattern assumes a subordinate role. In general, the different distributions between pattern, meaning, and context provide a way to think about interrelations between close, hyper, and machine reading. End quote. There is, however, no question of aesthetics here, and no investigation of whether these different modes of reading ultimately produce new or alternative aesthetic experiences. And granted, it might be the case that in this, um, in this formulation, aesthetics do not exist at all. Um, that might not be a concern, or it might be a statement about their marginality or their outdatedness. Um, but in any event, they are not addressed. And for example, Questions like, is close reading the sole prominence of the aesthetic, um, do not come up. And if so, um, further, is the aesthetic therefore incommensurable with digital text? This is the main question, um, due to the nature of their physical form. And so, to sort of continue on this line of thought, ultimately, Hale's formulation um, too neatly associates digital text with hyper-reading and an attendant adaptive loss of concentrated attention. And this loss of concentrated attention is very important for reasons we'll see shortly. In some ways, this supports my notion that the textual materiality influences our own preconceived categories for reading experiences. Um, because John Glory, for instance, raises several questions about his you know, tendency to associate deep attention with duration and the items typically associated with humanities research. However, even raising these questions forces us to confront relationships between attention, reading, forms of textual dissemination, and aesthetics, which ultimately is the absent seat in all these discussions, um, and particularly between this back and forth between Hales and Galori. The hyper-attentive reader, Galori argues, can still have their attention held, but this attentiveness is not always extendable to other artifacts. This is a curious argument in view of his broader claims, which seem in my reading to elevate the practice of close reading over and above different mediums and textual items, which are essentially, or essentially become interchangeable objects on which to focus one's attention. To quote Galari, if reading is implicated in Hale's deep attention, it must at least broach the threshold of reading closely, whether or not it conforms to the disciplinary technique of close reading formally and still prevalent in literary studies, end quote. For Galori, Attention, once fully elaborated, extends to all media and all literature, 
However, I think there is something worth pursuing in the transferability dilemma he describes, the ability for one to transfer uh, deep attention amongst or between um, a series of physically different mediums or objects. On the one hand, Hales argues that on the, on the one hand, Catherine Hales argues that digital texts produce and indeed require hyper-reading. And on the other, Guillory um, argues that close reading can function equally well for any text. Both critics, I suspect, are making close reading the categorical gateway to a specific kind of aesthetic experience, while not saying what it is exactly that prevents or allows for aesthetic encounters in each situation. They're not sufficiently attentive to the role of physical forms in this case, particularly non-electronic forms. Um, which is a curious, given their focus on multimodality. First, and this is critical, Hales argues implicitly for the notion that hypertext literature cannot or will not foster deep attention, that it promotes hyper-reading, and this is often seen as part of its ephemeral nature or um, its failure to take, it, to take in an institutional or popular sense. This is why people don't read electronic literature, and this is also why it has not been... Um, welcomed with open arms into this sort of traditional canon of English departments. Um, so against this, in Appendix C, I've attached an image taken from Michael Joyce's uh, Afternoon, A Story, regarded as the first published hypertext fiction. Hypertext literature of this variety is typically viewed as requiring different reading strategies, and I don't dispute this point. However, if Hales, if Hales argues that close reading alone produces aesthetic experience, and electronic forms generate primarily hyper-reading, then this piece would effectively, on the sole basis of its medium and resulting organization, cede any aspirations towards aesthetic value. However, as an example of the role a physical form plays in these matters, I'd like to offer appendices D and E, which are photographic representations of the Canadian poet Anne Carson's Knox. This text is equally fr fragmentary, if not more so than Michael Joyce's, with an astonishing collage of images, text, and reversible printing. Its physical instantiation in print safeguards it from vocabularies of disassociation and hypermindedness, and invites close readings that aim towards aesthetic apprehension. Gallori's contention, moreover, that both of these objects are equally ripe for close reading strikes me as slightly off because it does not account for the sheer differences between reading these objects. Neither is necessarily closed off from close reading, and by extension, aesthetic experience. But the categories that direct the nature of this experience will necessarily be different for each on account of their obvious physical variety, which will require certain modifications or adjustments in the kind of close reading that brings out their aesthetic qualities. Leveling off these differences will forestall a rich opportunity to question how these physical forms impact what and how we read and the relationship between these practices and our aesthetic experience.